Good afternoon, everyone. Second day of the Southport Winter Whiskey Festival. Uh, we had some great fun yesterday with uh, with Douglas Lang, with William yeah. Grant, who reckoned they were big, but I reckon, uh, I reckon Calm bigger than William Grant. I don't know. Do, do we do a size thing later on? Uh, <laughs> we had, um, who else did we have? We had Paul Dempsey, our old friend from Spay. And of course, we finished off last night with uh, Ian McAllister from Glen Far. Glen Far, shit. Glen Scotia, shit. Start again. So, um, delighted to have uh, Callum on this afternoon. He, we first met in the summer festival where uh, he joined in a few of the sessions. And uh, I asked him if he would uh, host a session uh, on probably the biggest whiskey in the world. Uh, the famous grouse. Um, I'm sure nobody's counting a few million bottles here or there between whoever else is big. Um, but but welcome, Callum. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for the invite, Mick. <laughs> um, so and hello everyone else. Um, it's actually good to put uh, faces to some of the names on the WhatsApp chat and the from the whiskey club as well. So um, th thanks first of all for joining. Um, it's, for me, a great, great, great to see people have got an interest and support for the famous Grouse brand, um, and also, I guess, what I should say first of all, on behalf of myself, but also everyone else at Famous Grouse, Merry Christmas! I hope you all had a, a, had a great time. I know it's um, been a bit of a strange year uh, with COVID, and arguably, it's, there's not been really many positives to take out of it. But for me, I think, for me be, being exposed to the the whiskey club that fix running uh, has been a big positive and I think congratulations to yourself Vic and the, the rest of your team just for the continued success of the club I'm, I'm, I'm sure the numbers have gone exponential in the last nine months or so so it's, it's really great to, to see that, see a positive out of what's happened in the, the last nine months 12 months or so um, and for me to be part of this Whiskey Festival really delighted to be part of it so, so hopefully you, you are the master blender for Famous Grouse is that, is that the, your correct title? Yeah, so essentially, in a nutshell, my job is, uh, or description of my role is the quality custodian of uh, the famous grouse and all the expressions underneath. So I need to make sure, essentially, whatever's in the final bottle, um, the quality of it is consistently of the same style and characters as the, the last dram that one of our consumers has had. Well, that's, uh, I have to say, that's quite a responsibility. Are yeah. You, people that's got like their nose and tongue insured for a million pounds no I th I th to be honest that's that's one of the nice myths you've probably heard that with <laughs> some of the Richard Parsons and Jim Beveridge's of all I've seen that question asked numerous times but no unfortunately I don't think anyone's pay paying an insurance uh, premium or policy on minerals unfortunately okay okay so well, listen we've got, four, we've got four whiskeys here where would you like to start I think uh, starting off with the famous house finest is probably the best place to start um, which is, well, I've got a bottle of it here. So, so essentially, that, this is the, the parent expression of the famous Grouse family. So, in terms of go, going back in time, um, the famous Grouse finest expression uh, goes all the way back to 1896. So, next year, we're going to be celebrating 125 years of the famous Grouse and the famous Grouse finest um, expression itself. So, it was created by Matthew Glog, uh, who was a, a wine and grocery merchant in Perth, which many of you know is a, a city towards the kind of east of east of Scotland. Um, it was a family business that started in the early 1800s. And as the century moved on, as the 1800s moved on, they, they began to more focus on whiskey blending and trading. So when Matthew Gold took it on um, from his uh, uncle, uh, William, in the 1890s, he developed a blend which he was very proud of, and he named the Grouse, which was named after a a beloved bird that um, basically roamed around the, the Perthshire countryside. And then in the early 1900s, the cult following was such that um, they get renamed the Famous Grouse, which obviously the name stands today as well. And it's obviously been around since the late 1800s. It's been through world wars, civil wars, economic crises, etc. And it seems to thrive as a brand that's thrived for nearly 125 years and even during you know the, the pandemic that we face ourselves in at the moment we've found that the sales have been really strong really resilient so it's it's a, it's a brand i'm really proud to be associated with so 
So, so in terms of the famous Scrouse finest, um, first of all, just have a nose of it neat. And feel free to have any comments. So, so in terms of, in terms of what I get from it, I initially get really kind of fresh fruit notes coming through, um, kind of caramelised pear, almost fresh green apples coming through, but underneath. What comes through is, and it stands out within within the kind of price point. I, know, I appreciate Famous Cross is an, an entry level whiskey for many. Um, you do get, the, as it's USP that makes it stand out amongst anything else, is that there is a richness coming through there. Almost for me, it's really applicable to this time of year. Notes of kind of cinnamon, Christmas cake type notes, quite rich in character coming through as well. And that, 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 that's, one of the, that's one of the big things that makes Famous Cross stand out is in terms of the cast policy that we have um, in maturing the whiskies for a long period of time before they're blended together to create the Famous Cross. We, we use some barrels that have, are of American oak species that have previously held bourbon that have uh, been transported over to Scotland for maturation, but the richness comes from our selective use of sherry casks. So that's either American oak casks or hogshead or butts, 225 litres or 500 litres in size, or European oak hogsheads or butts. And these, once they've been seasoned with sherry out in Spain, give really rich characters. Uh, the American oak casks tend to give more vanilla citrusy notes, which I think do come through in the top notes. And then your European oak cast, the European oak species tend to deliver the more spice, dried fruit, you know, raisin and sultana notes come through. And we, we balance up these three type of casks to try and get the balance of flavour, but we do verge more on trying to get the richness coming through. Is there the a rough cows. percentage that you use in terms of the casks? Um, I say that, I, I, obviously, percentages, I have to kind of <laughs> keep my, keep my kind of lips sealed slightly, but it's a significant amount of percentage to get the, the flavours coming through. So hopefully... And please, please say if you don't agree, but there is certainly for me a richness coming through. We don't want to make it too one-dimensional. We want to get the balance of the different characters. We want to get the fruit notes, the spice notes. We want to get the kind of vanilla notes coming from vanilla, fudge toffee notes coming from the bourbon cast maturation. But we also want to get the richness there as well. So it's all about just making sure that we use enough of a percentage to let everything else sing eh, in harmony almost. In terms of the casks, Callum, what fill do you guys go up to? Uh, it varies. We tend to, whenever we bring in brand new casks, so so we call what we deem a first fill cask is something that's just been, you know, it's been toasted on the inside, it's held sherry, and then it comes over. So at that point, when it's filled with new make spirit, that's a first fill. So we'll tend to maybe use two or three times we'll fill a cask with malt, and then we'll probably give it a few more lives after that with grain. But we have, in terms of the quality control process, we, we nose every single cask that goes into a famous grouse. And uh, going on to, to Vic's point at the start, we, we sell 43 million bottles, well, give or take 43 million bottles a year. So it's a lot of casks, it's about 80,000 casks a year that we are nosing um, that, that, that contains whiskey to, to then go to be blended to make a famous cruise up. So it's a lot of nosing. And at that point, either myself or one of the team will determine whether a cask is no longer suitable for filling. So even though it's a big volume product. It's number one in Scotland and has been for the last 40 years. We do have a big ethos of quality control um, and the casks is a very important part of that. So Callum, what's like a typical day for you? Um, you say obviously you've got a nose, a lot of samples. So yeah. a typical day for you at Famous Grouse when you're creating a new vatting for another another go to Famous Grouse. Yeah. Like, so, what's a sort of typical day like? That's a, that's a good question. Um, the answer to that is there's no typical day. <laughs> they're all they're all different. Um, but the, the main crux of my role, unsurprisingly, uh, we our sample room, which is called 106 Sample Room up in Glasgow, uh, is the bread and butter of my role, so to speak. I'm always using this my my nose for nosing. So on a typical day, we could be nosing anywhere between four, five, six hundred samples a day, depending on um, depending on what's coming across the bench. So we uh, we'll nose all, all across the supply chain. So at the starting point, we, we nose all the new make spirits. So this is tankers of new make that have either been produced at our own distilleries that we own, or we do third-party trading. So we trade with other um, 
uh, companies within the whisky industry. Um, malt or grain you make from them. So what we're doing there is bringing in a sample from the tanker that's arrived prior to filling just to check that that batch is of the right character that we need. I know we, we could be using 20, 30 different whiskies within the famous grouse and we do that for a reason. Each of those distilleries, and I appreciate many of you will know this, all have their own unique character. So we need them to be having the ones that have got fresh fruit, we need them to have that. Ones that have got slightly waxy character, we need them to have that. The ones that have slightly more, slightly cereal heavier characters, we need, need them to have that. And those distilleries which have PT characters, etc., we need them to have that. So we could be nosing that. Um, we have varying cash styles on the go, um, you know, doing new things to make hopefully what will become new innovations, new, new members of the Grouse family. That could be part of the day. Um, and the bread and butter, obviously, is that each and every single batch of famous grouse, we'll be nosing the, the, the spirit out of the casks before we actually approve the cask to be emptied of spirit uh, to create a vatting as well. And a kind of extra part of my role um, being Master Blender, I, I link directly into, I'm part of the famous grouse leadership team. I do link in with marketing, you know, about potential events like this, tasting notes, uh, helping them with concepts to try and make the you know the branding marketing more appealing etc so it's a it's a really varied role um don't know if that answers your question but it's not boring it's not boring no. how do you keep your palate like fresh because if you're sampling if you know in that many whiskies and that many new mixes in a day do you have to reset your palate after so many nosings or have you sort of tuned your nose now to sort of be able to pick out the right notes at the certain at certain uh, drums that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, I, I don't know if you noticed with the, the famous guy's face. I actually, this is more by habit now as well. I've added, I've added probably about one part, it's one part whiskey and then another part water. So basically I've diluted it down to about 20%. And to your point, if you're nosing four or 500 samples a day, if you nose them at cash strength, which could be 60% or even at 40%, your nose will very quickly become anaesthetized. You'll, you know, you, you won't be able to pick up anything. So the way we do it professionally within the sample room is we will reduce the samples down to about 20%. And what that does, it, it takes away the effect of the kind of almost alcohol sting that you get in any whiskey, and it allows you just to get the, the softer characters and flavours to come through, which A, allows me to do... I, I wouldn't do 401 one, one session, even at 20%. I would take a break and go and get some fresh air. I think some people... Um, recalibrate on those with coffee beans i don't tend to do that i, I tend just to go and get some fresh air uh, but by going down to 20 percent allows you to do more uh, but also allows you to pick up the good characters that you're looking for but it also helps you pick up any taints that could be picked up along the process so again going back to kind of the quality control side of things that allows us to pick up all that as well because it's it, even though the, the batches of the famous crowds can be quite large in size one or two bad casks especially when you're dealing with sherry casks we we, we can be quite uh, we are very particular about the sherry casks we have people out in spain picking them but i'm sure many of you are aware that you can sometimes pick up a sulfury note in sherry casks and because we leverage our, our flavor style so much on sherry cask maturation if we if we don't you know pick out that bad cask and remove it from the blend then it could come through in the you know the overall batch which is not a good thing as well. So, will you be nosing them in? Will you, will you have new makes first, and then you'll go bourbon second fill, bourbon first fill, and then you'll go sherry cask? Uh, it, it tends to the, not be as ordered as that, it, especially because we're on a production site. Um, but if we have a if we have an order of samples, we'll always make sure we have the almost the most delicate whiskies all the way through to the heavily peated whiskies. So. We, you know, if we've got a batch in it, it tend to be grains first and then the more kind of green grassy type whiskies, just the more heavier ones and the peaty ones at the end because the peaty ones are the ones that can really um, impair your, your ability to know other samples. And will they be pre-poured and breathing? Uh, usually, yes. With, uh, that's an interesting question. With COVID, we, we at Edrington have taken it really seriously whereby... Not the, no, the full team haven't been together since March, so we've almost had to rotate people working in the sample room. And what that really means is we don't have the luxury of having someone always pre pouring our samples. So quite often I'll pour them myself now um, and then 
to your point, I'll probably go away and let them breathe. I've got a, I don't have it with me today, but these are the glasses we use here, which is perfect. Can you see that okay? Yeah, you can. Um, I'll use the vapors to go up, but we always have watch glasses on top as well, which helps build up all the vapor and flavor in there so that when I'm nosing it, I just get exposed to the flavor uh, that's, that is breathing out the, out the whiskey. Okay, so, so just, just going back to Famous Crow's Finest, so hopefully you've had a, a chance to have a good nose of it and uh, um, feel free to have a taste, I'm maybe on catch up here. But for me, very sweet echo in the nose, but you do get a real nice smoothness, which is part of the Famous Crow's signature still, but you get that nice warming richness of the malts that have been matured in either American oak sherry casks or European oak sherry casks. So the smooth and balanced um, style is part of the the family signature style for famous Krauss. And that, that we've talked about the richness coming from sherry casks, but the other parts of the the style come from two things. For me, the, the green whiskies are really important and I'm glad to see that this whiskey festival has had green whiskies in one of the sessions I think yesterday you were talking about. Green whiskies for me are just as important as malt whiskies. I know there's quite a lot of bias in, in the industry about single malts and they are exceptional. The grains are just as important for me as a blender of a blended malt whiskey. So very sweet, delicate in character, but they also help within a blend to open up all the more intense characters of the malts. What we uh, also do, yes. Can you tell us which grains go into this? So is it, is that, is it lots of different grains or just from one distillery? No, it's a, it's a, it's a fair point. Um, I, I don't know if you're aware of Edrington, which um, Famous Krauss is part of. So we, it's no big secret to know that North British is a is a key part. Um, North British green whiskey is a key part of the recipe. We do, however, and it's very important for me to get as many whiskies to play with for blending, just to you know get the the different complexity of character within the blend. We do use other green whiskies within the blend, and um, we do trade it um, with with the uh, other competitors within the industry so we do i can't answer your question with what specific ones we use but we do to get that complexity of character for famous guys do use green whiskies from other distilleries um, and, so, uh, sorry i know that you've got a few more whiskies to that's okay um, I, can try, so, so I won't uh, i won't bore too much but i'm just interested in terms of um the quality control that you were talking about what's the earliest famous grouse finest that you've tried um how does it compare and do you go back and check against the younger ones the earlier ones yeah to be honest the, the earliest ones i don't I've, I've not been exposed to ones that are more than probably three or four years um old i, I don't have ones I, I do need to go into auction sites probably and get some of the earlier ones just to see what I'm up against from the past. But in, t in terms of the style, uh, the recipe hasn't changed too much. And if you looked at the distilleries underneath it, yes, because some distilleries are unfortunately now silent or not trading anymore that we would use. But the flavour profile has, in a large part, stayed the same. And it's all centred around this significant use of sherry cast maturation within the blend. You, you sp we, 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 we met a couple of weeks ago and... Uh... I was dropping some some boxes of whiskey off to you, Calm. Yeah. You said you said you'd been in in your current role, I think, since earlier this year, maybe January, February, and yes. you're just starting to kind of put your own mark on on the blend, which which kind of indicates it that, that you've you've got your own style or preference on how it should eventually taste. Is that, um, you know, so so you you, you must have some levers that you can pull. Uh, when 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 you when you develop the the taste and the smell over time, yeah, I think uh, the key thing for me, I mean, I'm quite I was talking about earlier next year's 125 years, so for me that's the responsibility, that legacy um, of selling, you know, now 40 43 million bottles a year is kind of resting on my shoulders. So I'm well aware that one bad batch or one wrong direction that I take could scupper that entire legacy so I've, I've obviously got to be very careful with what I do but yes I mean for me it's all about looking at are the cast good enough can we do better with the cast can we get more character out of the casks are we using the right suppliers so I work very closely with our cast supply team but also in terms of the new make distill that we're getting in is it the right diversity of characters that we're getting and are the, our own distilleries um, 
doing the you know giving us the right flavors as well for famous cows so these are things i'm constantly challenging and to be honest we're, we're now in an age whereby with many companies where we're getting challenged on sustainability so part of my role as master blender is to have a feel for are the distilleries we using you know the most energy efficient ones you know we don't want famous cows to be known as one that's creating a big carbon footprint within the environment so that's almost a modern it's a modern consideration as a blender now i think we've got to make sure that we are we're not damaging the environment and producing this scotch whiskey as well cool so, i have to say it's um and, and, and i can probably speak for a few folk that in, in the southport club it, it has been a few years uh since i really tried grouse or looked at it i mean it was i remember when i was growing up it was um you know, there was the usual blends on the on the bar in in Kilmarnock or Ayrshire where I used to go drinking, and grouse was always I don't know it was maybe 15, 20 pence more expensive than the others. So so I only I only ever bought it when it was a treat. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but coming back to it, uh, like all, really all these years later, um, I'm, and and a lot of people have said this to me in 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 the last uh, month or so since we um, we we started putting the festival together. It's really, really good and really, really drinkable. Um, yeah. A few folk polished their bottles off in, in short order and came back for more. Um, so hats off to you, really. Uh, that's great to hear. No, that's good to hear. Yeah, there is, there is always that thing. I, I came into the industry about 10 years ago and there was always that thing, especially with my friends, because um, I'd have been in my mid-20s then, you know, the likes of grouse or their old man strengths on the good. So it's it's great to see people coming back and re, you know, almost reappreciating it and how good the flavour characters are. So it's really I'm, good a bit I'm a bit surprised that with Victor being Scottish, he didn't just wait until it was somebody else's round and then order grouse. I didn't like 15, to, 20 pence. I didn't like to say that, Steve, but yeah, if it was somebody else's round, I would I would specify grouse. Either, right. either that or black bottle. I'm, I've got I've got a wee uh, kind of secret fetish on black bottle. But it's quite different to this. Yes, it is quite a different style. So so is it is there any other questions about the famous Grouse finest? Or do you want me just to move on? Let's move on to the next one. Um yep. you've got you've got a wee bit of diversity here. Yeah, so the, the next one I was going to move on to was bourbon casks. So so the, the, the kind of next three, um, ex, or the final three expressions are, you know, the, these as a as a master blender, famous guy's finest, the, the first class we had, that, that makes up about 95% of our volume. And, you know, you're, you're looking after an expression that's been in existence for almost 125 years. The, the, the kind of creative juices for a, for a blender or a master blender is when they get the make their own kind of expressions within within an existing family and the bourbon cask wine cask and smoky black are, are examples of expressions that have not been in, in the family for that long i think the wine cask is really recent and um, so it's, it's great to be able to have a play with the inventory or cast trials finishing etc just to to you know create something new create something that's your own so it's it's a really enjoyable part of being a master blender is getting involved in innovation uh, the big thing always that comes back yeah you, you can have fun making it but from a serious point of view the responsibility on you is to make sure that if you're creating something new that if someone who's drank famous cows for five years 10 years 15 years whatever um drink it yeah it's something new but it does come back to that signature style that rich smooth balance character um that's at the heart of the famous cows style so so that that's that's the kind of the brief that we always have is can you do this but always come back to making sure that it's a it's a grouse blend that that's key so so in terms of innovation as many of you will of you will know within the scotch whiskey regulations we we are reasonably tightly bound by what we can do we can't like with other um spirits industries we can't add flavors except so we have to when we're trying to get new flavors do it by essentially traditional means so it's either through looking at the raw materials that you're using, you know, variations on malt or, or, or the grain that you're using at a distillery to give you new flavours. That's one way. And the other way um, is through looking at the cask itself, either for maturation or for finishing. So again, we're quite tightly bound by the, the type of wood that the cask is. It has to be oak, but you can play with the different species. 
for vote, or you can, again, reasonably tightly regulated as you can season the oak cask with very, you know, variable different other spirit types to generate new flavours uh, into your whisky. And within the grouse, we have various trials ongoing just now looking at, well, I can't really tell you, but loads of things, you know, we've got probably in 10, 20, 30 different uh, trials on the go to see if we can find that new expression for a future release date. So that's 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 part of the role as well. Can I go back to an earlier question is reviewing ongoing experiments that we have. Um, the, the majority of casks that we have within our inventory are either European or American oak. And as I said, some of those have previously held bourbon and some of those have previously held cherry. So they're, they're quite traditional means of um, how we get our casks in uh, within the industry. So in terms of the trials that we do, some some work, some don't. So that's that's just part of the research and development that we do. Um, in terms of bourbon cask and wine cask, they're part of the, the cask series range. So that, that was the, the remit behind that was really to showcase how different type of oak cask or previous fillings of the oak cask can influence the flavour and how, how can we as the famous grouse do it in a famous grouse style. So the first one uh, I'm going to pick is the bourbon cask. If you want to just take a a measure of that. You mentioned how obviously this has been going for a long, long time. And in that time, lots of distilleries have either closed or gone yep. silent. Um, do famous grouse have those barrels at their dis uh, disposal or is it part of Edgington Beam Sanatoria and you'll never see them? Sorry, I didn't quite understand. Uh... So, so the older distilleries, uh, some of those closed distilleries, yeah. have, have you still got access to them? No, no, uh, we, we don't. We, we'll ha we'll ha I think we do have some in our inventory, but the, the, the style of them, and the, they are so far gone, because if we're talking about distilleries that shut in the 80s, their, their character doesn't quite fit in with the famous ghost style, to be sure. honest. So, so. It's one of those if we you're talking about famous guys, thirty year old. So if, if if there was a a desire to bring back that range, which would be excellent for the record, but um, mm -hmm. then we do have we do have inventory there that we could use, and it, for me that'd be really exciting to be able to try and play with a really old stock um, to to bring it into the you know the kind of famous grouse style, or maybe a famous grouse version of the ghost and rare or something, something like that. Yeah, okay, okay. yeah, so. So with the with the bourbon cask, as I mentioned, was famous grouse finest. It's all centred around, um, in terms of uh, famous grouse finest, the the use of sherry casks within the blend. And the we do use bourbon casks, uh, bourbon cask maturation within the famous grouse finest blend as well. But its role is really to support the rich characters within the famous grouse finest. You know, through the the sherry cask maturation. What the bourbon cask is really doing here is almost flipping finest on its head, whereby we do use a small amount of American oak sherry cask within the famous grouse uh, bourbon cask blend, but it's really just act as a foundation to the, the sweet fudge vanilla notes of the American oak uh, ex-bourbon barrel maturation that's of, you know, it's a significant part of the famous grouse uh, bourbon cask blend. So for me, for me, the bourbon cast within Famous Guys is quite an unsung hero because people te technically, or t sorry, typically pick up on the more rich Christmas cake uh, notes within the Famous Guys finest, whereby for the, the bourbon cast expression, it's allowing those more floral, vanilla, uh, fudge toffee notes to come through. So it's a, it's, a, it's a completely new blend. It's a different makeup of malts and grains to the Famous Guys uh, blend. It's not a finish, it's... it's but, uh, using a significant amount of whiskies that have been matured for their whole life in first fill American oak barrels. Do these tend to, uh, these um, expressions, the cast series, do they tend to stay UK or are they going worldwide as well? Uh, it's a good question. Some of, some of them do go to other countries. Um, um, Bourbon is in the UK and I think um, that there is areas of Europe uh, we have port that's really big in Portugal and also in the Nordics as well. Um, and wine cask is in, a, is in a couple of countries in Europe. Um, Europe's pretty much the heartland for famous cows, uh, for those that don't know. Uh, and we, we've got the wine cask here in the UK. It's a 
an exclusive mainly, or, or it was an exclusive mainly to Waitrose as, as well. So, um, and Smoky Black that will come to later on. It's it's definitely out in in Europe in the Nordics as well as the UK. That's where I got my wine cask, Waitrose. So. Yeah. <laughs> only place I could find it. I was like, he's got wine cards. Where am I going to get that from? I know. Yeah, it's an exclusive. So, so in, ter in terms of the, the bourbon cast expression, for me, very fragrant notes of uh, caramel, honey, fudge, vanilla. So for me, um, and this is, this, is, this is why I love working on whiskey whenever I'm nosing whiskey. It's, it's very emotive. It takes me back to past experiences. Um, and for me, very much takes me back to the those originals that my grandpa used to have um, whenever I went to visit my gran and grandpa. So just really, a really nice sweet expression of the famous grouse. And what I'd always do if you haven't finished it already is go back to finest just to, to compare and contrast. Whereas the, the bourbon cask is quite sweet. You get the that fudge, vanilla, those originals you do when you go back into the finest, that Christmas cake aroma does fly, you know, it comes flying out the glass at you. So, very nice contrast in styles. And then on the taste, very sweet, coconut kind of citrus fruits coming through, but it is very smooth in the true famous Krause style as well. It's lovely. Well done. Yeah. Okay, is there any questions on the, the bourbon cask expression? Um, a bit of a nerdy one. We all know the Scotch Whiskey Association have these old regulations and everything about what you can call a whiskey if it's got a certain percentage of whatever in it. With this being a bourbon cask release, is there a certain percentage of bourbon cask you had to use for it to be called that? Or is it just sort of... No, it's, a, it's a really good question and it, it also comes up if you're doing a cask finish and we're coming on to wine cask shortly. For me, um, there's no there's no specific percentage that we, we get told um, by this. SWA, but there should be a discernible difference. So you, for bourbon cash, you should be getting that discernible sweet fudge toffee character coming through. And for the for the wine casks that will come on to you, you should be picking up a you know a, a noticeable uptake in the kind of aromas that you would associate with that previous filling or with that oak type. So and that doesn't matter whether it's a finish or a, a fully finished, a selectively finished. Or a you know a, a matured expression, it, it, sh it should be a discernible difference that you, you're picking up. So we're not we're not to be honest. I don't think we're so tightly regulated. We don't have someone with a clipboard coming around and checking whether we're doing it or not. But you know if, if we're going to be not conning the consumer, we have to make sure that they are picking up the notes that we're talking about. And a you know <laughs> for me, for me to be embarrassing to be doing this kind of thing people like are not picking that up but also it'd be good to get the feedback if we're not picking it up then it's something that we're we're not doing enough of we're not we're not finishing long enough we're not using enough of those type of whiskies in it and we should really be looking at making it more um more real more credible. Oh, you're safe. that's that's definitely a bourbon cast you're all right you're safe <laughs> yeah. Yeah. thank you <laughs> <Whew>. <laughs> okay so what kind of age yeah. range of whiskies uh, do, you, do you use, Callum? I mean, obviously, it, it needs to be at least three years old, but I'm, I'm assuming uh, it's a few years older than that as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a range. I mean, I mean there's, I'm not hiding anything in the bottle. There's no age statement. I know you, you'll see plenty of age statements um, during this festival, so it's, it's not aged. So what, what that allows us to do is batch by batch, is we, we can use different distilleries within the makeup. We can use whiskies that have been matured for longer periods of time. The, the key for me is flavour, so making sure that we get the consistent flavour batch by batch. So to answer your question, we are we are using a variety of different ages within the blend to get that character, but also we've got such a vast inventory. Some warehouses could be closed or you know snow could block. We, we need to have the flexibility to be able to draw in a, vari a variety of different stocks at any time. Incredibly political answer. Very well put. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's one. It's one of those like when people ask about the recipe, which obviously includes age or different distilleries, etc. Um, it's very obviously very commercially sensitive information, and it's it's the same for any of our competitors. I'm sure they've given you a, a similar type answer. Um, but for me, and hopefully, 
you know the proof's in the glass. As long as as long as you're enjoying it, as long as you're picking up the flavours and characters, then that, I think that justifies and you know that almost puts the age and the different distillery, you know, naming specific distilleries, all those type of arguments. Hopefully, that can put that to the side. Hopefully, <laughs> George, I, George, I remember um, a tasting at the Soho Whiskey Club. And I can't remember the guy's name. If I Googled him, I would find him. But I think he's the either master distiller or master blender for Jack Daniels. Um, and the club was full to the rafters. It was, you know, it was really, really popular. Uh, and he did a great tasting, to be fair, of Jack Daniels, which which I'm not really a fan of. But it was really interesting to hear what he had to say. Um, and several times during the night, he was asked, look, if you go into a bar anywhere in the world and... Um, they don't have Jack Daniels on it, on it, which is maybe a wee bit unusual, but they don't have Jack Daniels. What other whiskey would you choose? And he refused to answer the question. He, he just would not say, he, he, his answer was always, well, if there was no no Jack Daniels, I always liked the local beer, I'd go for the local beer. Oh no, there's no <laughs> beer either, the beer's off. So I, I'm kind of saving the question for Calm here, see if he, 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 you know, if you go into a bar and there's no grouse, what are you going to choose, Calm? Yeah, I mean, uh, you obviously have seen what I've bought. I, I, I'm I not talking as, about what you've bought. <laughs> I know. No, I mean, no, what, what I mean is, sorry, what I mean is, uh, as part of my job, I think I need to know what's out there um, and um, and learn and appreciate new whiskies. So, you know, I do like trying the ones, you know, recently uh, uh, been exposed to Bimber, so English single malt whiskey, which is really nice, or the Japanese whiskies, the likes of... Hibiki, um, Yamazaki or Chichiba that I've been fortunate to get. So things things like that. But you know, I'm 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 happy to go to other I've in my career, which it's no secret you can look it up. I've used to work for Diageo and Chivas and they have they have they have fabulous products too. I'm not going to slate anyone's products, so we're quite happy to to try other expressions of different uh, different competitors on the bar. It's I wouldn't be ashamed to say. Obviously grouse is a prime focus for me and it's something I do enjoy drinking anyway. So, so uh, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that it has to be grouse or nothing. I think I think people need to be exposed to a variety of different whiskies and the different styles that are out there. Is that a good enough answer, or did you want a specific whiskey? Or? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, th- I think that's fine. We'll um, we'll keep you in the job for a wee bit yeah. longer. It's, I a know, well, it's a better answer than the man from Jack Daniels. It was I know. A bit yeah. one-dimensional. Yeah. No, I think I th- yeah I think we're in a fabulous industry, and I think I think you'd be you would be very shuttered you know if you were only ever for me if you're only ever drinking one whiskey i think you know obviously people are hopeful keep continue to drink grouse but you know to get the the feel for the variety of different things out there be it single malt single grains or anything like that i think i think you you know the, it's good to to be exposed to everything that's out there because it is a fabulous industry we're in and we make a variety of great whiskies variety of different flavors for different occasions so yeah Cool. Callum, one of my, um, you mentioned green whiskey, one of my favourite um, gross expressions was snow gross. Yeah. When it came out. Um, I've actually been, I drank it all when it first came out and I've been dying to get some, so I've got a couple from the auction sites and there's one in the freezer at the moment. Yeah. But any plans of bringing it back? Because obviously it is green, single green, which is obviously, I personally quite like, but it's, it's, it's quite yeah. unusual. Yeah, no, it's funny you should say that. I mean, it was, it was, it was removed from the range before I started the Murrow, but um, for Christmas this year, my wife got me a famous grouse advent calendar, which quite handily some of the miniatures in it were snow grouse. So it was quite nice to, like you, I can't be, not even in a staff shop can we buy snow grouse. So I'm, I'm either limited to just like myself to be going to auction sites for the miniatures. And it's it's a great whiskey. You know, it's a blended green whiskey. So it's got, you know, a variety of different green whiskies within it and it works really well. I guess you find it really delicate and sweet. Because um, you don't have the maltiness in there, really easy to drink. So, at the moment, in terms of the kind of strategy for the brand, that I'm part of the leadership team that guides it. That, that I think it's not part of the strategy at the moment to bring it back. At. Looking back, I think it, they maybe released it too soon because now grains are starting to get a bit of traction. You know, obviously the Hague Club got a lot of attention because of who was linked in with it, etc. And uh, hedonisms come out from Compass Box, uh, grants are doing Gervin, etc. And it's great to see them come out because green, green whiskies for me are very undervalued and under uh, unappreciated within the industry. So it may have just come out too soon, but I, w- I wouldn't rule out it as relaunching something 
uh, at some point in the future, but I wouldn't expect it too soon. So I see that I see an auction's open today. So maybe if you can get some snow grouse, I would get some at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, well, we'll move on to the third one then. Third expression, the wine cask. Excellent. Yes, please. Okay, so so whereas the the bourbon cask expression was was you know changing the recipe of famous grouse finest and using different malts and different grains and basically using a, a greater percentage of whiskies that had been matured in first fill bourbon casks. The wine, the wine cask is about fin finishing for whiskey. So we have taken malts and grains and we've matured them in either, you know, ex-bourbon, American oak barrels, um, American oak sherry casks or European oak sherry casks. We've blended those together as a final blend. And then we have every single drop, we have ran back into uh, hogsheads um, that have previously held red wine in the case of the wine cask and left them for a significant period of time that we, that we monitor on an ongoing basis to, to get through this more, for me, indulgent, richer character into what what turns, what turns what has become the famous Krauss wine cask expression. So did you make that blend, it, so I'm guessing it wasn't just a, a blend of finest, like famous Krauss finest, it was a blend that was sort of created in order to go into those wine casks to interact with the cask as well as you wanted it to yeah it's, it's about trying to get the you know the the makeup of the malts and grains and the malt what we call malt to grain <coughs> malt, to, malt whiskey to grain whiskey ratio just right so that we get the character and the flavor out of those finishing casks um yeah we had a bit of fun with um uh ian McAllister from Glen scotia last night uh we did a wine cask uh, uh, with, with with him last night, and um, he, in his notes when he sent the bottles over, gave us the chateau, uh, and we we put it on the website, and we like I got we 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 wrapped out in the knuckles from Loch Um uh, Can you say a little bit more about what kind of wine cask uh, you use? Without, without naming it. Yeah, I mean, it's what, to be honest, it's not one that we, I said red, red wine cast, it's not one that we typically, I wouldn't put it on black and white, put it that way, because sometimes we're, we could we could be limited by what um, what stocks are out there. Um, but at, at the moment, what we do is, is Rioja, red wine casks. Okay. Um, but that's one of the challenges, um, because we don't, whereas we, we have a, a really tight relationship with our, Cooperage out in Spain that season casks with sherry. We're very specific on the sherry that we use to condition, season our casks before we get them for maturation. With wine, it's a wee bit more of a challenge um, to get. So there, there could be issues with supply. So we, we, we may in the future have to change what supply we get. But then that comes back to me as to make sure that whatever white red wine that we use does still give us the same flavour on the final wine cask expression. And do you think the? I mean, you, you you've you've said it there from Rioja. Do you think the the marketing people might have had a wee bit more fun if they'd put that on the label? I think the I think the more specific that we can be with them, the better. And um, but sometimes we've got to be realistic about making sure that we can we can fulfil the demand that's going to be out there for the product. So that sometimes I have to be that you know the the damp squid in the room whenever in market to meetings to say these are all great ideas if you were selling five cases but here we are you know we're tens of thousands of cases for this expression of you know, famous grouses millions of cases we need to make sure that we can be a sustainable brand and you know doing it for years one two three four five with your projections so yeah. so that's you know that's my production hat on I try, i'm trying more and more to become more marketing so that i get a nice balance to appreciate where they're coming from but at the end of the day, I'll get no thanks if I run out of spirit, you know, run out of whiskey for a bottling because I haven't prepared enough. So, fair enough. Yeah. So, if you feel free to have a nose um, of this expression again, feel free to go back to bourbon cask and finest. I, I'm, I'm, I always go back to the finest because that's the benchmark within the range. For me, for me, we're now getting into, and it's the same with the port cask finish, uh, the ruby cask expression as well. For me, it's a more indulgent expression of grouse. Very vibrant in character, getting notes of red berries and spice, uh, nutmeg. But then on the taste, that's really for me where it starts to come to life. Yeah, 
really fully bodied in character. Definitely, definitely still voluptuous and smooth on the palate, but very fully bodied. Dark chocolate and slight pepperiness on the tongue, kind of dancing about at the tip of the tongue there as well. So it's for me, it's a, it's, it's a nice indulgent grouse expression. What's the kind of batch size in terms of the amount of casks that you're using? Um, it's not that it's not that big. Um, typically, it, it does it does vary. It can go between fifty and hundred casks at a time. It's not it's not big. Um, very much depends. Going back to my you know, earlier point on what's available to us as well, um, and. I know someone might ask, how long do you finish it? <laughs> and uh, there's no, how long do you finish uh, the whiskey and the wine cast before before bottling? And to be honest, for every batch, it's never the same because we there can be, especially when you're dealing on small bespoke batch sizes, you can get variations in how long it takes to get that right effect of the, the wine cask, you know, the previous wine uh, and drink within the cask, how long it takes to have an effect on the whiskey. So we, we will monitor it on a regular basis. And then at the point that it's, you know, you've got the balance of the the fruitiness and the richness from the, the kind of typical Scotch whiskey, and then you get this added layer of complexity from the, the wine cask finish, we will, we will then take the, the whiskey out um, of the cask and sit it into marrying cask to rest for a period of time ahead of bottling. Um, and that, that's probably one thing I forgot to mention. Probably one thing that makes grouse a wee bit special. I'm, I'm sure other companies do it as well. But for finest, when we are, we don't just blend the malts and grains together and then bottle it. We'll bottle. Uh, sorry, we'll blend the grains together separately, and we'll also blend the malts together separately. So they're, they're almost in two bats essentially at the end point. But what we do with the malts is we will take them down from cast strength to about forty-five and a half percent. So we'll add some water. Uh, on top of the whiskies and essentially allow those casks, uh, sorry, allow allow the, the blended malts to marry for quite a long period of time. And that helps to smooth and refine the character and integrate all those complex flavours um, of the, the malts, which on the palate makes them a lot smoother as well. And that when you add the grains to complete the blend, helps get that, that smooth character um, for the famous cows. And we do it for not just for finest, but for all of our... Um, Cast series and smoky black, we there will be a degree of marrying uh, of the malt component within the blends as well. So you marry the grains, you marry the grains separately, you marry the malts separately, and then you bring it together and bottle, or do you marry again? Uh, no, uh, we, we don't. For finest, we don't uh, marry the grains because they're already delicate enough in character. Adding the water doesn't really add anything. Uh, so, but we do blend the grains together at cast strength separately. We marry the malts separately. And then we bring them together and, and then we, we bottle them. What, what that also allows us to do is to, you've all heard, heard of chill filtration. I know a lot of single malts will have on label non chill filtered because of the 40% the, the, the bottling strength of grouse. We do have to do some kind of chill filtration. But because we've done this marrying process, the chill filtration is actually at quite a high temperature. So it's a real gentle filtration. So what that means is we're not taking a lot of the characters out of the whiskey during filtration that maybe some other expressions uh, need to do. Um, and it's all because of this marrying stage. So it means all the characters from distill, you know, from the raw materials, distilling, um, maturation, blending are all retained within the whiskey. We're not losing any during processing at all. When uh, when Victor last had a Zoom call with uh, Mr. Grant from Glen Farkness, um, he said something which I found incredible, which was that it's so cold up there that he actually has to raise the temperature to yep. chill filter. So is that what you guys do too? We, we, we're okay um, with the insulation in our, um, you know, in our bottling plant in Glasgow. We don't typically find that too much... Um, yeah, we don't. You know, I'm trying to think of any occasions where we've had to do it. No, we don't typically. It's insulated enough where we do the the filtration piece that we don't have to do it. But to your point, I have heard that that's the concern that you know you don't have to even put the chiller on. You just use the the ambient temperature to do your chill filtration. <laughs> and um, uh, going back to the the man from. Uh... Uh, from Jack Daniels, he 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 he, uh, he took a little bit of stick about you know people putting coke in in, in their in their whiskey, and I know that Chris Lodge is on here. He puts coke in his uh, 
and these Lafroy. Um, do you make any considerations when you're when you're uh, putting this together about what mixers people might might use with it? Yeah, for me, for me, um, it's very important. Famous Grouse is a, for me a great example of it. It's a very a versatile drink. So for me, whenever I'm you know creating a new whiskey or or any whiskey I'm associated with, it needs to work kind of traditionally, you know, neat or with a, a dash of water or with an ice cube. But it's also for me, um, it's, it's good if you can create a whiskey that also works well. And hopefully this isn't sacrilege in the environment I'm in, that it can work with, you know, Coke or in more elaborate cocktails. And for me, Famous Grouse does work like that. Um, I do enjoy it neat um, or with ice or as you've seen with a dash of water. But depending on the occasion, I'm quite happy to put ginger uh, ginger ale in it. So a ginger grouse, um, as they call it. I've tried it with a, almost a take to the Famous Grouse coffee, the Famous Coffee. It's just a take on an Irish coffee. It works in that as well. So it's got the characters. It's got fresh fruits, you know, characters and flavours, rich fruit characters, spice notes, dashes. You know, a very small amount of smoke in there. So it's got it's got all these characters in there that makes it very versatile to work in a in a variety of different serves or styles. And for me, I wouldn't slate anyone um, for mixing mixing a whiskey. To be honest, it's really about how folk enjoy it. But maybe maybe if they had like a 60 year old and they mix coke in with it I'd probably draw the line there but for, for most whiskies if they want to enjoy it with any, uh, any kind of serve then you know more, more than happy carry on as long as it's famous goes I'm happy but if we knocked on sample room 106 and yep. heard you say come in we wouldn't see you with a bunch of different types of misses sticking it in not 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 typically no um that 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 will come during if I'm creating we're working on a couple of new expressions just now and that will be a question that will come from uh marketing colleagues is you know what can we do what serves can we do and at that point I will bring in things to to have a play I'm not I'm not a cocktail master so it won't be it won't be like going to a fancy uh, cocktail bar in Soho or or Shoreditch or anything down in London uh, you know it'll be very basic and Grouse works very well with basic mixers uh just to check that you're getting, you know, you're getting flavours from the whiskey coming through with the mixer as well. So I, I'm happy to try that just to see what works and what doesn't. I had an ex-girlfriend from a long, long time ago. She used to, she used to put uh, Iron Brew in, but it was the original Iron Brew. I don't think it was any of, the, any of that Namby Pamby stuff they've got now. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I've tried Grouse Iron Brew, to be honest. It's more, more ginger ale that works for me. But um, what, however folk like it, I'm happy with, don't worry. <laughs> So, so is there any other questions about anything we've done before or the wine cask expression? Or will I just move on to the, the kind of grand finale? Smoky Black. Smoky Black, yep. So, so this, is, this, is one, this is one, I'm always asked what's your favourite one. It's always like try to pick out your favourite child. But I do, I do have a kind of fetish for kind of smokier whiskey. So I have to say this, this one, if it isn't finest, I will maybe gravitate more towards Smoky Black uh, if I had the choice. Um, but for me, it's quite interesting with regards to Famous Grouse. I, I mentioned it a couple of minutes ago about having a dash of smoke within within the blend. But I think, and hopefully you can agree, when you're nosing Famous Grouse, the kind of sweet flavours, uh, fresh fruit, rich fruit, spice notes come through in the Famous Grouse. Finest, but I haven't really mentioned smoke at all. And I don't think, for me, the, the, the peaty smoky notes come through in the Famous Grouse finest at all. It's not really part of the signature style, whereas if you had a Johnny Walker, for example, it's part of their signature style, robust smoke, and that, and, and you know they, they design their recipe accordingly to, to maximise that. Within Finest, we do use a small amount of lightly peated whiskey within the blend makeup, but again, it's more there to support the fresh fruit, rich fruit, spicier notes within the blend. And interestingly enough, if we, t we have tried it, taking out those peaty whiskies from the blend, does it make a difference and it actually does it just obviously it breaks down the balance of the blend and that's part of the art and the magic of blending is even things that you don't really that don't make an impact on the blend you know that they are supporting the other characters there and if you take them away it the blend just falls apart so um so so anyway moving on to, to smoky black um this was more around showcasing that within the famous grouse inventory that we we do have some exceptional smoky whiskies uh, that we we have that we get to use within within that we have access to within our inventory that we don't use in finest 
that we, we, we wanted to showcase within the Famous Crowds family. So that was almost the genesis of the Famous Crowds uh, Smoky Black. And it was also a demand, I think, from one of our Nordic markets that um, there's monopoly markets in Norway and Sweden. And uh, there was an opening for a, a new smoky expression. And uh, we, we put together a blend it turned out to be smoky black and put it in for tender and that actually won the placing uh, the placement the um in that country and that, that basically led to smoky black going into the nordics but then it got expanded to other markets including the uk so 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 as, ma as many of you know where where the smokiness and the whiskiness goes back to innovation is that the smokiness comes from drying the the wet malt over a peat smoldering peat uh, smoke and that smouldering smoke uh, infuses onto the drying malt and through milling, mashing, fermentation, distillation, maturation, that peatiness is, remains within the whiskey uh, and it's very much a Marmite thing that I'm aware of. It's a, either folk love it or folk tend to hate it. So um, it, is, it is a very key part of Scotch whiskey flavour um, that some, some products don't have it but there are obviously really heavily peated single malts and there are blends that do have a small amount of uh, peat within the, their makeup as well. And for me, Famous Grouse Smoky Black is a really nice bridging point between the the people that love peated single malts and people who love blends. For me, uh, Smoky Black gives you that smokiness, so almost the intensity of character that you don't typically get with most blends, but also has other characters within the makeup that might attract people to try it that are used to just normal blends to move from a, a typical blend to this kind of smoky a biased blend, maybe into single malts. It's a great bridging point between single malt drinkers and blend drinkers for me. Would you be more likely to use, say, Beaumont and Laphroaig in this um, and then Highland Park in your finest? As a yeah. Lighter... yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. So yeah, I mean, for, for Famous Grouse, finest we use lightly peated uh, whiskey and for those that are aware of the Edrington group Highland Park is obviously part of it so it's not too much of a giveaway to know that we do use Highland Park within Famous Grouse Finest. For Smoky Black what we we actually had a pool of stock um, of heavily peated whiskey as part of a trial and this is where you know this is a great example of a trial that actually works out but it was uh, whiskey that was so heavily peated that we don't use it in Famous Grouse Finest at all. So it's actually quite an exclusive, special um, pool of stock that we have access to that solely goes in exclusively into Smoky Black. So to your point, it's, it's heavily peated is more of along the lines of your typical Isla single malt um, element that we, it's not, it's not solely that that's within the blend, but then we blend it with grain whiskies and different malt whiskies to get the, the balance of flavours in this famous crowd style. But obviously, and you feel free to have a nose now, the main character that flies out the glass at you is, is the smokiness for me. You do get you do get fresh fruit flavours. I get green apple coming through, but the richness is there from the the, uh, the sherry cast maturation as well. But the main character for me is smoke. For me, it's quite maritime in character. Um, I, I live I live in Presswick. For those of you who aren't aware, it's on the west coast of Scotland, and literally looking out my window there, I'm on the beach. And for me, it just if I'm out on the beach, it's almost as if I'm actually outside on the beach looking across to Arran. Just I really get a real waft of seaweed type note coming through in there as well. So it's it's very very of all the expressions today versus finest, that's the one that's the most different, and that's that just shows the, the impact that the smoky peaty characters have. Uh, within a within a whiskey. Callum, don't you just say um, I, I've never tried Famous Grass before. Um, but okay. when you said it was part of the, uh, the festival, I thought I've got to get a pack of this just to just to try them. Um, so as part of that, I bought a bottle of the um, okay. Smoky Black. Yeah. Um, so I got that maybe a week ago, and it's half gone already. Yeah. It's really good. You know, for, yeah. for twenty pound, you 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 can't say anything wrong about that whiskey. It's really really good. Yeah, no, no, and thanks, thanks for your comments. That's uh, that's great to hear. Yeah, for me, even though it's smoky, sometimes smoky whiskies can be quite a bit of a challenge for people. But for me, smoky black is is really accessible. Yes, you get the smoke there, but if you have it on the taste, I've added. So I've added a couple of, again, just 
added some water just to open up more of the flavours. Again, um, on the nose, again, it's, it's the smoke. It's, it reminds me of being at a barbecue, almost bonfire yeah. smoke coming off as well. But if you have a taste of it, yeah, it's smoky and you get that kind of peppery spiciness coming through, but it, it's really smooth, you know. You know, it's, it's easy to go back in and have another sip of it. It's, you know, it's it's really easy to drink. And I think going back to my earlier point is that it does act as a nice bridging point between people who are probably ardent, single malt, heavily peated drinkers, mm -hmm. and you know, people that are maybe on uh, trying famous Crow's finest. You know, they might be pleasantly surprised if they tried Smoky Black to realise <clears throat> that smoke done in the right way or blended with the right whiskies isn't as challenging as maybe they thought. No, that's right. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Glen Scotia fan. Um, you know, most of the whiskey I drink is Glen Scotia. But you, as you said, you've got some saltiness in this as well, which is is what Glen Scotia do. And I think the, the saltiness and the, and the smoke just come through really well. It's, it's yeah. excellent whiskey. Yeah, no, thank. No, that's great. Great, great to hear that feedback. <laughs> yeah, I think you could be onto something with this, Callum. Uh, I think you might you might sell a few bottles of this over the through the world. Do you expand it around the world? People might buy it. You know, absolutely. <clears throat> and it's one of those, if you add ice cubes to it, um, if you go away and come back, <clears throat> and if you like smoking this as, it's a good idea to add ice cubes, but it just it just brings out more smoke. <clears throat> um, so it's, it's, for me, it's a really, it's a, it's a really good way of, because uh, Famous Grouse isn't, isn't renowned for really dealing with smoky whiskies, whereas Smoky Black shows that we can do smoky whiskies just as well as anyone else within the industry, I think. It might get Chris Lodge off uh, putting coke in his uh, expensive look like. Yeah. Do you have to keep telling everybody about that? <laughs> but to be fair, it is the only way to make Laphroaig palatable, um, is to put coke in it. But it has to be coke, anything else will ruin it. Don't put Pepsi in it. Um, uh. <laughs> this is fantastic. I, I really like this. Um, I think that people that are in whiskey clubs, do become quite snobby about the whiskey that they drink. And, and we start chasing the, these expensive whiskies and single cast whiskies. And this has been a great reset for me, this. Um, you know, we, we go back to what we were drinking last night, the, the, the Glen Scotia. And although I've, I'm COVID positive at the moment and, and I've got very, very limited taste and smell, um, the Glen Scotia really was like doing a round with Mike Tyson. Um, it, it was just hard work. It, it, it's, it's a big hitting, fighting whiskey. Um, and to come back to this, this is just like a gentle massage. Um, it, it, it's beautiful. Um, and, and I will drink more of this without a doubt. Uh, as I say, I think it, this has reset uh, my whiskey experience. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of glad as well because whiskey's been getting very expensive for me um and and to be able to come down to to not come down to it that's that's quite a poor way of, of saying it really isn't it um you, you know i appreciate the fact that if it wasn't for blended whiskies like this we wouldn't have single cast whiskies we wouldn't have the, the whiskey experiences that we have nowadays um it is down to the big boys like yourselves that allow us to drink um, the single cast, because if it wasn't for, for your input to the industry, which is the majority of the industry, 85, 90% of it, then we wouldn't experience what, what we experience. So I think, yeah, we should, without a doubt, drink more of this stuff. It, it, it's fantastic. Thank you. No, thanks. No, I appreciate that. You've got to remember, it was like, what was their one's first blend? I mean, or first whiskey. I mean, it was, for me, it was like Bells didn't like it. Then I liked it, and then I tried Grouse, I liked it. I couldn't figure it out for ages until I realised that it was owned by Edgington Group, and I like Highland Park, and that's obviously a, a component of it. So for me, Grouse is my, call it my go-to blend, if you want to call it, um, in the UK, unless I can get VAT 69, which is my father-in-law's one, but that's a, that's a, that's a different story. I've got speed for that. But uh, for me, it's just, as you said, it's... Um, it's a go-to whiskey. You don't have to think about it. You just like sit back in front of the telly, bung a bunch of ice and then poke in it, ginger, whatever it is. It doesn't really matter, does it? It's just it's it's a good um, suck and jam. To be fair, John, I was brought up on Vat Sixty Nine, but my father worked for the company for fifty years. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, so much, so like, I have to show you this. This was, I was at a whiskey tasting recently and uh, there was an auction and there was a bottle of a four and a half litre bottle of Grace, which I sort of put a bid in for. And I'm, well, fortunately, I won it. So, hey. <laughs> so next one then to say for, yeah, I've no idea what I'm going to do with it, but uh, it's, it's basically, it's, uh, who knows, I haven't been to save port yet, so it's on my wish list. Once COVID lets me travel, it might come down with me, put it in the bar. <laughs> nice. So the, I, I, uh, the last time I was at uh, Glen Turret, so they've got the, the, the full experience there. Do you, do you have much input into what, they, what they've done up at Glen Turret? Well, actually, Glen, Tur Glen Turret's no longer part of the Edrington Group, so we, we're, we're not associated. Back. We're not, we're not, we're not, and we're uh, the famous Grouse experience is no more. So we don't, we don't. A leading have question, Victor. Yes. <laughs> so we, we, we no longer have a kind of distillery home as such anymore. Callum, I've got a very general question. Yes. How, how important is November, December? What percentage of famous Grouse do you shift for gifts November, December? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good point. I don't, I, to be honest, I don't have an exact percentage for you, but yeah, a, la, a large part of our volume is probably probably going all the way back to September, October, November. You know, ahead of Christmas time in the UK is you know a critical time for the famous grouse. Um, UK is our biggest market, and of, obviously with gifting and occasions, etc. Uh, a lot, you know, there's usually people drinking, or there's more people drinking famous grouse at that time of year. So yeah, that's it's a, it's a very important part of the year for us. And a follow-up question on that: what um what kind of percentage is on trade, and what kind of percentage is off trade? The majority of it's off trade, um, so I th is it, it's somewhere between t ten and twenty percent on trade. So, uh, so, um, so you, with obviously with COVID happening, you, it has had an impact in terms of sales. But what we found is off trade sales have offset that <laughs> they've gone up so uh, and uh, we, we have lost out a wee bit as well with global travel you know with the uh, duty free not being uh, used as much you know with flights being grounded or or restricted now and um, but again off trade uh, we've we've found it a really we found it really resilient particularly here in the uk when i go to my local tesco or as the shop uh, the, the ground shelves are usually half empty you know they're just constantly getting topped up so again it's great to see as long as folk are having it responsibly, obviously, um, it's great to see people are going back to the going back to to what they love and what they know, which obviously seems to be uh, famous crowds. So, Callum, one hundred and twenty-five years next year. Yeah. Have they let you go mad with the spreadsheet, or is it a case of you've got to satisfy a global market, so there might be one that will be sort of a a generic one hundred and twenty-five year bottling, and you might do something a little bit smaller. For sort of the, the more whiskey nerd crowd, do you think? Or are you, are you going to do something that's going to satisfy you in sort of, you know, this is my mark for grouse? Yeah, we're, 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 I can't really say too much. We are, we are working on a couple of expressions that probably I'd like to think will be the tail end of next year. Um, we have, hopefully understandably, we have been a wee bit derailed by what's been going on around the world. So there, there will, I'm sure there will be some way, especially pack related, that will, will mark a very important anniversary. Very proud to have lasted 125 years um, and, and still be going as strong as we are. But there, there are a couple of new things in the fire that we are we are working on um, to, to, you know, just enhance the family. And what about the, you know, uh, George mentioned at the beginning his beloved uh, thirty-year-old famous grouse. Yeah, is is a, the, the much age, age statement uh, what going on? Not at the moment, to be honest. We, I think the, the age statement expressions are great, um, but I think I, I don't think from a sales point of view they worked out as much as we hoped. So they were kind of removed from the the strategy, you know. Was it ten, ten years or so ago? Um, so we're now not uh, not so much focusing on age statements at this time. But for me, you know, I think I think there is a time and a place for it. So hopefully, it will come back into into you know as an option later on. Good. Well, listen, I've thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed the last seventy five minutes, uh, and I've thoroughly enjoyed the whiskey. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone get any any further comments or any questions for Callum while we've we've we've, we've got him here? Just this was brilliant. I really enjoyed it. I've learned a lot 
like it's like um, Chris touched upon. We tend to get distracted with being the the massive whiskey nerds that we are about the stuff that's right under our noses. And I've learned a lot. I've really appreciated this session. It's been brilliant. Yeah, similar sentiments. Really impressed with the wine and and the, the smoky black. Really good. Thank you. Great. No, th thanks for your time as well. I appreciate it. it's a family time, so taking taking seventy five minutes, ninety minutes out of your time, I really do appreciate it. And for me, um, especially with COVID, not seeing as many people, it's great just to get that that kind of customer facing interaction. I'm part of the whiskey club myself, but it's great just to to get a bit of feedback on you know my day my day job, and at least I know that I'm earning my money. <laughs> great. Well, listen, thanks very much. Uh, Calm. It's been it's, it's been a great start to the second day of the the whiskey festival. Um, we will continue on at four pm. I'm looking at my spreadsheet to see who we've got. Who have we got at four pm? Tomatin. Sorry. I think it's Tomatin, isn't it? Tomatin. We have. We've got Scott Adamson. I better give him a call. He's always late. Um, so uh, I wouldn't do that. But but yeah. Thanks again. The the, the famous guys has been an excellent start. Thanks, Callum. And I'll yeah, see you all in, in uh, 45 minutes. Yeah, Thank you very thank much. You. Cheers, Victor. Thanks, Callum. Thanks, Callum. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. See you later. Thank you.